各位同学，大家好。Good morning, fellow practitioners. <coughs> 那我们<coughs> 呃介绍了好几个那个修行的。So to this point, we've already introduced a variety of methods, and we talked about the basic principle behind these methods. We also talked about the sequence or the、um, procedure of using the method, and we've also talked about the,、um, uh, the destination, or we basically summarized the experience of enlightenment through use of the methods such as、uh, Huato. And silent illumination. <coughs> and the purpose of talking all, about all of this and explaining all of this is to give everyone a basic idea of the path of practice. And having this clear idea, having this、uh, comprehensive understanding of the method. The process, the goal, and the principle behind it, then this actually is a great help to our practice, because we have a clear direction, <coughs> a clear goal, and we have a proper understanding of how to apply the method. So it's very important to have this comprehensive understanding.、Uh, it will be of great assistance to your practice. Now, 这样的一种呃方法呢。Uh, <coughs> so <coughs> we've introduced all these various methods, and in introducing them, we talked about how each method has a strong point, but it also has a weak point. And in making use of these methods, we should, of course, learn how to make use of its strong point and not fall into its pitfalls. <coughs> and we introduced a whole variety of methods. And there's an advantage to that, because we have a, again a more comprehensive understanding of how all the methods share the same principle and how they all work. But then there is a disadvantage of teaching all these methods: is that for many of you, you want to use all of them, and each time we introduce one, it's like,、hmm, yeah, this one sounds good. Let me give this a try. And then, after hearing all the methods, probably make use of all of them. Maybe for a little while, use one method, and then feel that well, this method's pretty good, but it's not really so good anymore. Let me try that other one, and then use the <coughs> use the next method, and possibly switching between all the different methods. Want to make use of all of them? Want to get get something out of all these methods? But unfortunately, with that kind of practice, it's difficult to really get deep into any of the methods, or get strength from any of the methods. And we introduce all these methods, well, because we can't bear to just give you one method. If we give you one method and it's not so suitable for you, then you're stuck. You have to use that one method. So. Again, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to introducing all these methods. However, it's up to you to choose one method <coughs> or choose a main method, and it's okay to use a couple of methods. But you have one main method, and then the other methods serve as supplementary methods. For example, you may have a main method, but at a certain point in time,、uh, there may be some obstacle arising in your mind. It may be a very difficult situation <coughs> that you have to deal with. And so, by, for example, using a supplementary method. Maybe picking up the Buddha's name,、uh, reciting the Buddha's name a few times. That can be very helpful at that time. You can use the Buddha's name in that recitation to help adjust your mindset, regulate yourself, and achieve some degree of calmness and stability. And then, after
after settling down and uh, smoothing over your mind, so to speak, you can return back to your main method and continue. And actually, the Buddha's name can serve as an excellent supplementary method uh, because you can just pick it up at any time, recite it at any time when you need it. And then, when you feel more able to make use of your main method, then again, you stay with that. So, uh, this is the case with any method you choose. It's important to have a main method and to really get deep into that one method. And the other methods can serve as just assisting methods or supplementary methods. Because otherwise, if we just want to just try this one, and then try that one, and then try this method again, eventually you get to the point where you're really not sure what you're doing anymore. You're almost blindly grabbing it, grabbing in the air, trying to get some kind of method. But uh, it's really hard to gain strength with that kind of approach. So, again, with whichever method you choose, it's important to stay with it, be consistent with it, and know its strengths, strong points, and the weak points, or the pitfalls. And if you skillfully use the method, you can make use of the strong points and avoid those pitfalls. So, again, it's important to choose one main method and use the others as just supports or supplementary methods. However, in choosing a main method, uh, if you find that after a period of time of using one particular method, it doesn't seem to be the right one for you, it doesn't seem to be the most suitable method, then it's fine to then change the method and then choose another uh, main method. <coughs> but the uh, most important thing is that once you change, again, this new method becomes your main focus and you should really apply yourself and concentrate on learning that method fully and making use of that method fully. So knowing about all these different methods is good because you have an opportunity to choose. And once you choose, then you stick with it. Uh, if after a while it doesn't seem to be the best one, then again you can choose from the methods that you know and then stick with that new one and work at it for a while. Uh, and this is the best kind of approach to uh, <coughs> selecting a method. <coughs> So we've also spent some time in introducing or explaining the procedure or the sequence of using the method. And this is very useful to know. But at the same time, this also has a um, pitfall. And the pitfall is when we're using the method, we're always thinking about when can I use the next step? Or when can I get to the next stage? I'm sitting there just, am I at the first stage or the second stage? Maybe the second stage. Or when do I get to the third stage? And thinking about this whole process, thinking about these stages or the sequence. <coughs> but then again, if we didn't explain the procedure at all, if we didn't have an understanding of this sequence or process of the method, we'd just be sitting there kind of, using the method, but we have no direction at all. We don't know where it's going. We don't really know what's going to happen. But still, knowing what's going to happen, oftentimes we know too much, but we know it all. So we know that, uh, yes, I, the next stage, I can feel it coming up next. We, we think we know it's going to happen, or we're thinking about it happening. <coughs> and this can be a great distraction to our practice because instead of focusing on the method in this present moment, we're constantly waiting or expecting or wondering when we can do the next thing. Kind of like if we're using the method of breathing, we're sitting there counting the breathing, counting. I wonder when I can stop counting. I wonder when I can just follow my breathing. 
I do it now? Wait a second. And already we're off the method at that point. It's, it's analogous to, you know, a lot of us when we drive cars now, we have what? GPS. GPS to tell us where to go, to show us everything. So the GPS is, it has a few functions. And if you notice, um, for the most part, there's the function of, it shows you where you are right now, and then will tell you where to turn, you know, where you have to go in the next few seconds. Right turn, left turn, whatever. But also, a lot of GPSs have a dual function where you see where you are right now, but then you see a, a bigger, you know, larger scale map from a distance. <coughs> And a larger scale map gives you a more comprehensive idea of where you are in the big picture. And then the smaller one uh, shows you where you should go at this moment. And um, always thinking about the process and thinking about which step we can get to, it's like looking at the big part of the map on the GPS and then driving according to that. You know, imagine if you're driving your car and you're just looking at the big the big map there. I don't know where you drive to or where you'd end up, but you know, you can't look at the big picture while you're driving. You have to pay attention to this moment. Where do you have to turn? Where are you going? So when we use the method, <coughs> we should be at this point, at the point where we know where we are. We know where we have to go right here. We have to go left, we have to go right. But it's still useful every once in a while to take a look at that big map. You drive, 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 you're aware of where you are. Every once in a while, you take a look and you know where you are in the big, in, in the big picture. So in terms of knowing the process of the method, this is, um, it's very useful, it's important because it gives us direction. We have a clear, very solid direction when we understand the process. But when we use the method, we have to be fully present to where we are now and not be waiting to change or waiting to go to another step, but just be very clear as to where we are now and use the method in this moment. <coughs> and in this way, we have a very solid, grounded kind of practice. And when we need to know um, what's coming ahead, eventually we get an understanding of uh, where we are in the whole process of the practice. But most important is to be right here. <coughs> and also in explaining these methods and the process, we introduce the experience of enlightenment, uh, spe specifically <coughs> through the use of silent illumination or huato. And again, this is very useful to know, very useful to understand, because it provides us with a basic concept, a basic idea of what's the goal of practice. <coughs> but again, it has another big pitfall, which is that once we hear about enlightenment, once we hear it explained and described, we want it. And we want it so bad we start to imagine. Start to imagine what it's like, we start to use the method as we're using it, thinking about enlightenment, thinking that, um, hmm, am I close? I think I can feel it. Or you know, try to imagine ourselves into it. And when we hear, you know, stories of the Chan masters, we also are very tempted by these stories. And we start to imagine a lot. And <coughs> uh, this is such a, a, a huge pitfall that we see that some Chan masters, when instructing their students, they didn't explain. They just told them, I'm not going to tell you. You have to figure it out for yourself. Or you have to experience it for yourself. And left it up to the students to do the work themselves. <coughs> but then again, if we don't give any explanation as to the experience of enlightenment and as to the process leading to it, again, a practitioner would have no direction. They'd have no clear goal. They would be again practicing blindly, not knowing where they're going, not knowing what to expect. So, 
It's important, but also there's a danger. And there are some teachings. Um, um, there's a, within the teachings of the six wonderful gates. Um, it talks about contemplation, returning, and then purity. This is referring to the practice, the process being you use the method, you continuously use the method, and eventually you have realization. And realization often refers to um, these four fruits of the path, uh, four realizations. <coughs> and it also mentions that with this part of realization, there's also a, what's called seeming realization. It seems like a realization, but yet is not. And it's just like when people are practicing and they feel something, or yeah, I think it seems that it seems I'm in that state. I can feel that state. And oftentimes, when practitioners explain their experience, they use these kind of words. Well, it feels like it feels like enlightenment. Right? I feel pretty empty. Or I seem to be enlightened, right? And this seem, seems like, or feels like kind of uh, attitude, <coughs> it's really, it's very clear that if something seems like something, it's actually not that thing. It just seems like it. Kind of like sometimes people say to each other, hey, you seem, you, you seem to look like so-and-so. But obviously that person is not so-and-so. They just seem to look similar. So when we <coughs> uh, have these different experiences, these different feelings, and then get a sense of, well, I seem to be there, we have to remember that seems like equals not. So if we seem like we're feeling pretty enlightened, then we're not enlightened. Or if we feel like we're in such and such a state and it seems like just what the sutras say or just what the explanation says, then we're not. <coughs> because this genuine experience of enlightenment is not something, a feeling. It's not feeling like you're enlightened. It's a direct experience, a direct realization or a direct awareness of things as causes and conditions, experience of selflessness. It's not a feeling of being selfless. It's not seeming like we're selfless. So it's important to um, know that when we have that seeming kind of feeling, it's not it. We don't want to be guessing and then imagining and then caught up in the idea of, well, is it or is it not? And then we often just get lost in imagination trying to picture that experience or, or grab onto that impression, or we <coughs> we often grab onto the explanation we're given about enlightenment, <coughs> and initially that impression is is good. It's useful because it gives us an idea of what is the goal, and for example, these various um, explanations that are in the sutras. They again, they give us an impression or an idea of what is the goal, what is this enlightenment, and again, what is the process. The purpose of reading the sutras is to get this idea, again, so we can uh, occasionally take a step back and gauge our progress, gauge our practice, see where we are, and see what our experiences are. Unfortunately, though, oftentimes when we people read the sutras, they read the sutras, they read the explanations, and then they start to imagine. They start to imagine what it's like. And while they're imagining, they imagine enlightenment, they imagine what the Buddha said, they imagine these fruits of realization. And of course, they imagine themselves in the middle of that and imagine that, I think I pretty much got it. This is pretty much what I'm feeling, so I, th I think I'm there. And... Using the sutras in this way is a mistaken way to use them. 
We shouldn't use them to imagine or grasp onto the impression of what enlightenment is, but we should just use it as a general idea to gauge our practice. And again, it essentially gives us the direction for what is the final destination. <coughs> so in the course of practice, it's important to remember that when we hear all these explanations, that we don't get caught up in thinking about them, dreaming about them, or imagining about them. We have a clear idea, a clear direction, but when we use the method, we just simply use the method. And naturally, when our conditions are ripe, we'll directly experience that for ourselves. <coughs> So again, with this enlightenment stuff, when we explain the state of enlightenment or experience of enlightenment, um, it's often misused by the person who hears it. In actuality, for a person who realizes enlightenment or awakening, they realize Buddha Dharma. They experience what the Buddha meant by what is impermanence, what is non-self, what is causes and conditions, emptiness. In the beginning, this is a kind of theory, basic principles. For someone who awakens to them, they experience them directly. And what they find with this experience is that these things are just it's very ordinary. It's actually impermanence, non-self, emptiness. It's really just, it's just the nature of things, the nature of phenomenon. They're just always like that. It's including ourselves. <coughs> so when they experience it, this is something very ordinary. It's not uh, something special. You know. And they become an ordinary person, the most ordinary kind of person. When the Buddha realized enlightenment, when the Chan masters had their awakening experiences, again, they just became very normal. Whereas if we look at the Buddha before his awakening, he was an abnormal person. He was a very, very unique person. You know, he, he practiced uh, ascetic practices for years. Every day he only ate like one grain of rice. He didn't sleep. He did all these uh, ascetic practices, extreme practices, and he became like completely skinny to the point where like you could see all his bones and you could see his spine from the front. And you know, he was all ragged looking. And you know, we get that impression that the Buddha, wow, this person is a mystical, strange, but very unique kind of person. Then, after the Buddha's awakening, what happened? He became normal. He would go to sleep when he was tired, he'd go into town and he'd beg for offerings and he'd eat his meal. Every day, he'd do normal things. He became a normal person. But it seems that uh, when people hear of enlightenment, they expect that it's really something special, something extraordinary. It's like when you get enlightened, it's like, this is some kind of special effects and mystical experience that's happening. <coughs> and that for someone who gets enlightened, they become this special, extraordinary person, just this you know, mystical person with this mystical uh, demeanor. And that, you know, what enlightened people, they experience awakening and then they, they fly everywhere through the sky. And actually, well, actually flying is no big deal now because we all fly, right? Most of, many of you flew here. So flying is not something special, but still, we have this impression <coughs> that uh, with enlightenment, a person becomes strange or abnormal and, and just something special. But the experience of enlightenment is something completely normal. And in principle, it's a process or it's a transformation. It's a simple transformation from being vexed to not being vexed, to having a mind of a chaotic mind, a mind with all these uh, 
chaos and contaminants and with awakening, the mind is transformed and these things are cleared, they're cleared up. And so a person after awakening becomes very normal, very ordinary and what do they do? Well, with a mind that's cleared up, their life is transformed. And instead of in daily life, because of having a chaotic mind, being confused, <coughs> and making uh, inappropriate decisions, making decisions that cause difficulty for ourselves, cause dis difficulties for others, a person who's awakened, their mind is very clear to the conditions at hand. Because they see the conditions clearly, they can make proper judgments, proper decisions. And these decisions are beneficial to others, and they're beneficial to themselves. Right. There's nothing mystical about this. There's nothing special about that. That person becomes very ordinary, very um, clear-headed. So the consciousness-only school describes this in a very accurate way. That enlightenment is the transformation of impurity to purity. <coughs> <coughs> the transformation of the mind from being vexed to not uh, being vexed or confused. So again, um, it's important to understand that enlightenment, uh, to understand the idea of enlightenment and have a proper understanding, not to have this very far out and really contorted view of what enlightenment is. Because some people, in thinking that enlightenment is you know, all of a sudden you become this strange person or you become a special person. Because of that mindset, either they're afraid of enlightenment, you know, they don't know what they're going to turn out to be if they get enlightened. They don't want to look like, you know, like Shakyamuni Buddha, he did that bony body with uh, no flesh, no muscle. They may be afraid of enlightenment because you turn out to be someone like that. Uh, or a person may be attracted to that. They're attracted to mystical experiences. They're attracted to special effects and attracted to being someone special, being someone extraordinary. And because of that, they come to the practice with a very strong seeking mind. And this is a seeking mind which is completely way off course in the wrong direction. And because of that seeking mind and being misdirected, they encounter a lot of difficulties and a lot of dangers in the practice. So it's very important to have an understanding of what enlightenment is and to know it's the most ordinary thing, to become a most ordinary person. And this way you'd have a proper perspective and a proper direction in the practice. So <laughs> 不可避免的会有一些负面的情况我们没有说 So again, the purpose of all these different explanations of the methods, the process, the goal, final destination, it's important that when you hear these things, you make use of this information properly um, and not grasp a hold of it and let it become an obstruction or create all these difficulties. So when you hear these explanations, it's important that you uh, know about them, you know about the process, you can use it to gauge your, your progress, use it to give yourself direction, to keep you on track. It's important not to let these things stir up the imagination 
or to get caught up in these explanations and get taken uh, on the wrong track. So this is really the purpose of, of giving this explanation, all these explanations. And we hope that uh, you make use of this information well to guide you in your practice.